Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and welcome to another Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. This is a weekly series that we have uh, where we invite guest speakers to talk about interesting things. This week's uh, speaker is me, talking about why uh, minimal viable product strategy did not work well for RackN and Digital Rebar, uh, what makes our case special or different, or how it might be exactly like yours. Uh, we had a great dynamic conversation about it. Um, and stay tuned after we wrap it up, because we actually uh, put the the chit chat part first, and that actually had also really great insights about the the topic. So enjoy. Um, but everyone's supposed to be at the table. The only way you're going to get accelerated speed is to slow it down, and you're going to have to be methodical, and you're going to have to bring engineering back to engineering. That's the. This is the. Actually, you're you're almost. We're, that's almost a perfect segue, and I'm tempted to just get get rolling on the MVP topic because. Um, it's the this urge for speed mm -hmm. is not faster from that that perspective. I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I think you're right. I think we have, you know, when it goes back to extreme programming, it goes back to iterative programming, it goes back to all that stuff. I, it, you start to begin to wonder what have we sacrificed in this you know, this all in search for how can we do it faster? And at the end of the day, this isn't accounts payable. This is not, you know, uh, marketing. This isn't sales. This is engineering. You're engineering something that can, you know, I always tell people, well, do you guys know where all the code is? Yes and no. I said, there's, you know, you got a hundred people working on a program. All of us have sliced and diced every ounce of code. The code's been around for several years. That means there's some, there's some probably hidden stuff that no one's ever touched before. I always use the medical analysis of going to surgery. You know, anytime you go into a patient, you can nick an artery. You know, you, you might not even <laughs> that area, that's, but you can nick right. an artery. And it's like you got. It's like they don't. Someone never sits down and explains to leadership. This is this is some tricky stuff. I this is one of the things that that we did in the last. Um, in 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 so we we went through a major release a year ago, where we we rewrote the the back end data store pieces, and like we're still going back through and and having finding edge cases where it's like oh. Yeah, that's a weird like you know DHCP lease renew, you know deadlock issue. If you've got you know a lease, it's like there's, it takes a long time. It's both sides of this, right? It takes a long time to get code through all the paths and all the scenarios. If it's really getting used, there's no pristine, beautiful like oh I wrote this code and it handles all the use cases. It's right it, in in ops especially it's messy yes and so so you walk in and you cut out a line that looks like it's uh, you know something and and somebody you know three steps removed from you all of a sudden stops working when they take the upgrade because you've removed some protection against some, like, <laughs> exactly would that, that would never happen uh you, yeah that might have could existed for a reason um <laughs> it's like like what is an appendix for not many people know but it's there for a reason <laughs> Doing, doing, doing something, yeah. Doing something. Now, these are, these are, this is a, this is a classic challenge from that person. It's one of the things when I was right big in the open source, open stack community at the time, and one of the mistakes that open stack made because they were, and this is, I, I think open source projects do this a lot, and it's one of my my new pet peeves with open source, um, or at least these these shining open source projects. Um, is that they they to per, to get critical mass and get all these adopters? They talk about what they want to do and what the product will be, and it, it's a marketing game. Um, and they haven't been through mm. the cycles of really battle testing the product. And so we we spent a ton of time with OpenStack with a very very immature base of code, promoting it um, as if it was going to solve problems that it wasn't solving. 
wasn't that wasn't ready to solve and was going to take more more code hardening time to solve. And so it's really, really hard to message that, you know, you know, this intent, I intend to build something really cool, but it's going to take a year to get it through this battling battle hardening process. Actually, maybe that's the segue to uh, MVP. Yeah, that is actually because I, I have it, when you mentioned what you said about MVP previously, yeah. I it just I'm I'm dealing with that right now, and 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 I've dealt with that, and I kind of when I first learned about MVP and understood it, I I I'm curious okay. what you guys are thinking because I I've, I I want to see if the problems that I'm seeing are what you discovered and that you solved for hopefully. Or am I wrong? And I don't know. I'm just. I, I got. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's let's have let's have the conversation. So, um, I'll do I'll do a very short intro, and then this is really going to be a story about Rack N, um, and what what we've done with Digital Rebar over the years. Um, so, and just by the way, you know, you all know me. I'm Rob Hirschfeld, um, and we started Rack N five years ago, and it was actually built sort of on the, the, the ashes or the base of something that was called Crowbar um, back when in the Dell OpenStack days. So we, we, we actually had built this OpenStack installer um, because we saw that the operation side of OpenStack was going to be really, really hard to pull off. It's, it's the, sort of the origin story of a lot of what we do. And what we really learned was that it's not about OpenStack, it's actually about data center operations. Right. So if you if you look at, at what RackN is trying to do, um, go, going back historically, we we believe data centers should be easier to operate than they are. Our mm -hmm. our job is to help companies run their own data centers. Um, and the, you know the funny thing about some of the the, uh, the messaging missed to me for OpenStack and what people really were desperate for in the OpenStack days is they wanted software that would help them run their data center, right? VMware was sort of helping, but only at the high level. You know, uh, I was at Dell. Dell, we weren't helping people run their data center. We were selling them kit, but we never thought about what it took to run a data center. Either you had the expertise or you were, even if you did, you were on your own when it came to actually putting all that stuff together. And when OpenStack showed up, you know, with the promise of being an Amazon alternative, uh, there's a lot of operational knowledge that has to get baked into that delivery. Um, and that's, I think, what, what we missed in what the market was actually asking for with OpenStack um, was, you know, help me run a data center, please, not give me software that runs VMs, because uh, that's not running a data center. Um, so the, the the challenge so that was that was sort of where Rackend's genesis was and, and and what we were what we were doing and we took when we started Rackend we actually started with a pretty big code library in, in the Crowbar what the time was Crowbar version two code base um, and we thought we could run into customers with this you know this code and and help them run their data center because it would do basic provisioning. Uh, OS deployments, RAID and BIOS, fig, uh, firmware configuration, did all this stuff. Um, and then we would start to throw in things like, uh, this is it's all way back machine, but Docker Swarm, this is pre-Kubernetes. Um, so we're helping people install Docker Swarm. We tried to do some OpenStack, early OpenStack install stuff, because that was sort of our legacy. Um, but the, the problem, and Keith, this is sort of where the question comes, is that we were, at the time, I was a big proponent of, of uh, minimal viable product, which if you go back like to the Eric Reese book, um, ends up being very SaaS focus or service businesses focus, SaaS business focus. And here's the idea. The idea is before you build a product, you want to know that you have the right feature set. You want to know that you understand what the, the critical, like the critical thing you need to be able to do for your customer is, what the customer's real pain is, what solving that thing is going to fix. And real MVP models um, 
they'll, they'll tell you to run, in some ways you don't even build a product, you build a PowerPoint or you build a box and you hold the box up and you say, is this, you know, would you buy this? Does this look good? And there's no product, right? The, the idea is to get the feedback before you build the product. Um, and then from there, if you get a yes, then you're building the skeleton of a product and you're, you're substituting a whole bunch of stuff with Mechanical Turk. So um, uh, a friend of mine's building, actually doing an, uh, a lean startup approach for a butcher shop. And for them, they didn't build any of the backend systems for the butcher shop. They literally, their first orders, they didn't even have the butcher shop, I think, for the first orders. They literally had friends text them information. They took down the order. They went like to, you know, a, a, another butcher. They delivered it. And they were just working through the process and finding out what, what the kinks were. That is MVP. Um, and so as they went further down the, the process, they got more and more sophisticated about, okay, these are the problems we actually need to solve. And there's a lot of logic in MVPs that you, you don't want to solve problems you don't need to solve. Right, Keith, I mean, that's the... That's it right there, not solving for what... How do you keep the discipline, though, right? You've got yeah. smart engineers that are thinking, well, what about this problem? What about that problem? But those problems haven't introduced themselves in this particular issue, right? Fight the issue in front of you, not the issue you imagine that may happen. And here's, here's where it broke down for us. Okay. Because, I mean, we've got engineers who understand these problems better, right? They actually really know the problems. For, for what we're building, it actually has to run a data center. And one of the things about MVPs is that part of the MVP says, I will put people in to fix the gaps in my process. And more importantly, it says gaps in my process are okay. In some ways, gaps in your process are good because they're exposing where, you know, where the need, right? This actually, let me be more specific. In an MVP, you, you don't build anything except what you think is the golden path through the process. So there's no guardrails, there's no extra components, there's, there's just that one process. When you're running a data center, right? And not, I, think this is, I think this is true in a lot of things. And this is why I think it's what I'm saying is general, but I, I'm going to go back to our specific experience. You, you can't run a data center on, oops, I, we didn't anticipate that case. Right? I, a couple of, you know, some is okay, right? They, people don't expect us to be able to just turn on CentOS 8 when it comes out in a, in a day. They expect, you know, they know it's going to take time. But once we get it, it needs to work. And then there's a whole bunch of, of parameters and options that also need to work. And so the idea that we would be able to MVP one operating system, say, on one piece of hardware, which is what an MVP would have told you, oh, we're only going to do Dell and we're only going to do Linux. Um, and we're, and, you know, we built the product that way. But it wasn't a sellable product because you can't, you don't actually run a data center on that one narrow thing. Now, if you're doing it internally and and you were trying to build, so say I was doing this not as a product, but as a like an internal um, provisioning experiment for a company, then I might do that. I might say, okay, we, you know, we have a thousand servers, 300 of them are Linux, Dell servers. I just need to handle that one case and I could build up for that one case. Um, and actually a lot of hosting companies behind the scenes, this is exactly, actually most companies, uh, in our business, most companies, have, that's exactly what's happened. They've, they've been, you know, um, patching their, their infrastructure up until, they've, until it's this big ball of twine that they can't touch. They, they don't, it's really fragile. Um, but when we took that approach uh, to, from building the infrastructure up as an MVP, so like, um, you with me so far? I'm, gonna, I'm about to explain some of the cases where yep, we Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. So here's here's what here's what we did. Uh, Docker Swarm is a great example because CTO and I, uh, Greg Altaus, um, were super um, uh, argumentative. Is wrong. We had a really healthy debate 
about you know what what workloads we should add into the system right do, are we just doing horizontal and do we need to get bigger horizontally do we need some val that workload validations to make it go we got to a point where we both agreed that we needed a workload Do and we picked docker swarm because at the time it was super hot to be able to install docker swarm um and so we did a docker swarm mvp which meant that we we built this you know, very narrow band of functionality to deploy Docker Swarm. Um, and it, it looked cool, it demoed great, um, but it didn't actually address anybody's real use case. Hmm. Because at the end of the day, it, it wasn't a repeatable process for anybody else because just that you know even if you wanted docker swarm all of the contingencies that it went in under that stack to make it work were not acceptable contingencies hmm. how, that, how, yeah, yeah so in that you you had to find the right voice of the customer so you had to identify your customer your, your the right customer not the unique case right but the general case and actually be that voice how did you do that? Oh, it's been a long, slow process, to tell you mm -hmm. the truth. And some of it, this is where it's not an MVP, is we can't deliver. And, and some people will tell you that we're just doing MVP wrong, and I'll, I'll, I can own that. But um, the, what we found is that we had to really do the engineering right under the covers for the use cases that we were enabling. So, so like this is the deception to me for MVPs. MVPs say, figure out your critical use case and deliver that. And what, what our critical use case was, was I'm running a production data center. I don't wanna have to worry that it's gonna be irregular. Is that right? And so, so it doesn't matter what feature I deliver in this. If, if that makes the pyramid that that features on top of unstable, I've, I've, I've undermined everything else I've done. So the times when we've like introduced a new feature and it, it made everything else not work right, mm -hmm. it actually slowed us down um, for making the systems work. That makes sense. But in that you, how, hmm. What led down the what led you down the path of solving for that problem that ended up making it un, more unstable? I guess where I'm hearing you, and this is mm -hmm. where I hear you going in my brain, is you could you could build a model on a case, whether it's a service or a product, widget, whatever, and you build it on a on a market assumption. But your market assumption can be skewed to the point where you're 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 an exception not the general rule. And I guess is how do you problem solve for making sure that you're the general rule, thus you're building a product that's sustainable, that's relevant. This is something we struggle, we struggle with, um, right? Because our, what we do, right, which is physical automation, it's bare metal software, it's software for automating bare metal servers. Um, um, I'm thinking about the the um, you know the the oxide people and getting they, I'd love to get them on the, the podcast to, for them to talk about the physical side of the bear, of the thing we go about that. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's actually a really horizontal use ca use case, um, and so we've been trying to find vertical places where you could just focus on like can you just provision these one things or do this one thing. Um, and I'd love it if that was the case. Um, I feel like I'm not answering your question right. Would it be possible that, that to have your customers vote on features that they're interested in? I, and then you it, know you're building something that you have a customer base that, are, that plan on using it. We use, we, so we chase customer and prospect needs a lot. Um, we used to do it a lot more, um, and I will tell you, we built so many 
um, sort of house of cards from that perspective. It actually, those, those were the types of things where somebody would be like, I just need a whatever um, to demo this thing. Uh, you'd be amazed at how rarely those actually turned into sales from that perspective. Um, because that, that one, I'm trying to think of, of I've, been, I've been trying to get better at articulating this. Ultimately, let me tell a different story and, and come back to that because it's a, it's a really good question. When we were in the early Kubernetes days, um, there were a ton of people doing like COPS. I don't know if y'all remember. Um, actually, these people still use COPS. Um, it's one mm -hmm. of the few things that are, that are still that are still in use. But there was you know it was Ansible scripts with Kube Spray. There's you know Kubernetes the hard way and all the all this stuff. And we actually had a completely automated Kubernetes installer on um, the last generation of the product that worked on multiple clouds, it did, did all this cool stuff. Um, and I couldn't get anybody interested in it. They were, they were much more interested in using Ansible to install Kubernetes, even though it couldn't do upgrades. It was, you know, there's, there's all sorts of challenges and as you would expect with an Ansible installer. Um, and I, I actually pulled a friend aside and I'm like, why is this so hard? Why doesn't somebody want to even try what we're doing? And they're like, because you have to install your software first. And then you have to use your software before you can use Kubernetes. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but you get all these other benefits to what we're doing and managing the gear and the life cycle and prepping the environment. And look, I can hit push a button and reset and reinstall the Kubernetes environment, which is right to, to the questions you've been asking. That's what our customers actually want to be able to do. The feature MVP wise that our customers really want is they want to be able to push buttons and have their whole infrastructure rebuilt with no, no, you know, like, Hey, I get it all right. Push a button, reset it, build it again. That's, that's right. The MVP for that, there is no MVP. <laughs> it's literally all the integrations that have to work to make the thing run end to end have to be there. There is no um, minimum. For, well, there's no, you know, it's, it's sort of like there's always something. Now, there is a degree of, I don't have to patch the BIOS to do that work. I don't have to um, integrate to Remedy to, to do that work. Um, but before any customer goes live on the system, I, I do have to do that. And in a lot of cases, when I'm in a prospecting call, I still have to do that. They still have to see that it's done all those integrations. And so the idea that I could MVP my way into a Kubernetes install turned, which I, which I always you know, want to be able to do is, oh, look, I've got this cool Kubernetes thing and it just works. Um, for us, turns into you actually have to convince somebody that you can help them run their data center better first. And you have to have enough critical mass in that feature set that their unique data center operations are, um, they can see a path to get to that, those, those data center operations. Does that, I, I'm, I'm trying to be very specific, but I feel like it ends up sounding a little vague. No, for me, it's, I don't know about Michael, but for me, it's, 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 what you're telling me is the, the hard part is, because I, every, even when Michael mentioned, can you do, you know, get your, the customers to voice their concerns or, or vote for them, I always think about the Apple problem, right? Apple pod, Apple and the whole um, iPod, you know, that's, that's the one thing everyone writes about. That's the one that, that, that goes against that model. There was no market for iPod. There was no, there was no one clamoring for that. They saw something and, 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 and they saw it before it was actually invented, right? And they created something from it, whole cloth. They told the customer what they wanted. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is crazy, right? I mean, and, and, and in a sense, I, I think, Rob, you've had some of that, right? You've said... If, you're, if, you're, if your problem is I can't effectively, if a company comes to you and says, I can't effectively run my own data center, and thus I've had to offshore, offshore or give it to someone else to do it for me, 
and you come and say, how, you know, you have to say, we can help you do it better, smarter, and cheaper, leveraging our tool. You've had to think about what are the reasons why they can't run their own data center, I'm assuming. It, I actually, yeah, no, we do. This is, so there's, there's a, you have to, you have to help people figure out that the way they're, this is, this is, this is sort of the trifecta that we're trying to figure out, right? Part of it has to be like, all right, we're actually going to help you run your data center in a way you're not used to running it. And that's hard, right? There, there's a, right. Part of the MVP says, I'm helping somebody do something they already do. And I'm just going to make it a little better. You're, I, I like the Apple, the, the, um, the iPod example, because, you know, people didn't even realize they could digitize music at the time, right? I was an early MP3 user and I had to, you know, I was like, people thought I was insane. I was buying CDs. I was ripping them to MP3s and uploading the MP3s. And it was all this work. And they're like, what are you doing? I don't get it. Um, and so to make iPods work, they actually had to build the iTunes store. Yes, they had to have the, <laughs> they had to think about how to solve your problem where you're buying the CDs, ripping them, and then uploading them. They had to create a vehicle by which they came that way and then build the storage device. Uh, do you, I mean, do you remember the pushback they had on selling yes. songs for $2? It was like, oh, what? Yes. I'm yes. never going to, no. Yes. Uh, they, and, they, and many credit them with rebirthing the industry. Industry, right they save the industry from itself mm-hmm. i guess man this is really and this is, i want to rip this apart so bad this is so fascinating for me because <laughs> i ran into I, I ran innovation and i'm hearing a sense of innovation in this. i'm hearing you know you do an experiment and you say okay um we have a concept of i, I remember this one we did with um chatbot okay. okay and you're thinking chatbot not sexy this is before it came back into Vogue. It was Vogue way years back. It went out of Vogue and now it's come back. Yeah. And one, we were doing a hackathon. And one of my guys came to me and said, hey, I want to do a chat bot where we communicate with the car. The car has a personality. And you can converse yeah. with the car and the car will really, it's like things like simple commands, like, where are you? And it'll give like a map to where it is. It says, what's your fuel? And it'll say what the fuel is because it tapped into the ODBC. And so we actually give um, all that information. And said, okay, what's the what's your VIN number? And they give the VIN number and you could talk to the car. And so um no one thought it was anything. I said, Great, do it, man. I thought it was pretty cool. You could chat with the car, the car could chat back, that's pretty you could do it. And we did it using Slack. I think we used Slack at the time. We could use Slack to basically do it. And um so I was working at an innovation team. We were part of a global team. So I let one of the guys in LA know about it. And he said, hey, this might be something. Can we figure it out? And they said, well, we're going to go. Um, they they, follow, they followed the lean product management manual, right? The whole yeah. kind of lean product, man, product, product development. And I said, well, I hadn't heard of that at that time. And I was like, okay, well, talk to me. Because I was used to the old surveys where you had customers and you actually you know, brought them in. The focus group says, no, 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 we do it this way. Well, well. Fast track. Turned out it wasn't a commercial desire for it, a consumer one. I'm sorry, it wasn't consumer desire. But there was a commercial desire for it. Hmm. Trucking companies like the idea. And not only did they want one version, they wanted two versions. One that allowed the driver to communicate with the truck, but also allowed the back office to communicate with the truck. And they wanted to split into two versions. And they were willing to pay for it. Oh, yeah. And that, that taught me a lot. It changed my whole idea, right? Of, of what does it mean to, to do the experimental move to MVP and be able to have something that represents something that you didn't even know that the customers were crying for but someone had an idea, right? And you didn't know the market was for it. You did your survey and found out that there was a market, but it wasn't the market you thought it was. So this is and how does does an MVP aid? What what you're describing is to to me where Racken has gotten to, um, which I would call an MVF for a feature. 
So, so what you're, what you're just right. You had all the pieces connected together, but you were delivering it in a different, in a different way. And, and so if you build this proof, like, like there are so many cases where if you can show somebody that it works, they might not know they need it. Like you know, your chatbot's a great example. I mean, and maybe you consider that whole product. You've actually just illustrated the whole, the thing, the whole thing actually works. Um, But it could be that what you're what you're doing is you've gotten to a point where you can do an MVP feature on top of every. Does that am I am I hearing your story right? I think it's when you have engineering talent that has the cycles and it's it's. And I'll tell you where, where it's done for my brain power. It's turned this whole concept of innovation to MVP on top of itself for me, and. You can, I understand wireframe, I understand the presentation, and that's normally what MVP represents. You have an idea, you put it in the PowerPoint, whatever. But when you have engineering talent and they're paid to do things like solve for problems that no one's thinking about, and you give them the room to do that, they can invent something, I think, the iPod in a sense, right? They, they think, hey, wouldn't it be nice to have, and then of course, what are the ancillary things around that? Let's make that product. What are the features that you can add, like an iStore? To, to me, if you were just building MP3s and you didn't realize, I mean, I guess this is back in the days with Napster and like Napster spawn, like the Napster grew up because all of a sudden there was a market for MP3s yeah. and you know, digital music. Um, there's, there's a component for MVPs that I, I still believe in and I think is super powerful that you're describing and that, that what we see which is you have to show somebody something, they mm -hmm. have a lot of trouble imagining it from a PowerPoint. Yes, yes. Um, and so the extent to which your MVP puts something real in front of them, it, that is very powerful. Um, so in, in what you guys do, mm -hmm. and how do you, manage that innovation pipeline, but also understanding that engineers sometimes are the worst enemies, <laughs> with, right? They're, they're solving for that, that minute problem they ran across that bugs them, but there is no market for it. How do you solve for that focus and, and keep it, you mentioned, you know, you were working through something where you had no boundaries, right? But aren't boundaries part of making sure that you don't go off the rails? And, and so this is actually bankruptcy, um, bankruptcy, you know, going to bankruptcy. Yeah, one of the interesting things about um, our product story that I, I haven't gotten into at all, um, almost a whole nother hour, is uh, a year ago we switched, we inverted our license in part because of what you're describing. Um, so we had been an open core software and then Racken had been selling all of the widgets and the plugins and things like that that went around in the product. Um, and we, we got to a point where we realized that was actually hurting us from an innovation perspective. That the cool, like a lot of the cool fun things that you would play with, we kept locking up and making, you know, uh, licensed or hidden. Uh, and so we switched, we actually switched the model so that the core of the product is licensed. We have trial versions and it's not that hard to get the core, but then you can plug in cool new experimental toys. We can do little experimental stuff. And those things aren't, since they're not, this is so weird because it's psychology as much as it is it reality. If I build a plug-in for digital rebar that does like I just did the, all this Raspberry Pi stuff all this I mean it's, it's super cool little Raspberry Pi automation it's out open source stuff it doesn't it's not productized you know it's it's it relies on the core being a product and that stuff keeps getting hardened as we go but I don't have to misrepresent that it's a product I can just give it away and say yeah here's some cool you know lab stuff to play with have a great day 
Um, and then hopefully people will play with it and, and have a, you know, get ideas and then continue to ideate around it. Um, that, I mean, that in some ways, that was an MVP for us. Like, you know, I, I, I thought Raspberry Pis would be really cool. We had some people who wanted to play and, you know, I challenged the CTO to try to build, you know, be able to automate these, these pies. Um, and then that's turned into a really a cool little thing, but it's not, I would consider that an MVP. I think all of us on the team consider that an MVP. Um, especially because I don't think any of us want to support it in production. But, uh, but it, you know, it, it takes advantage of everything else we built. Um, Hmm. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm looking because I, I have a whole bunch of notes that I was thinking and I'm, I'm glad we just kept in stories and, and talking um, I, you know I think I think for what we're talking about the MVP demonstrates it really ends up being an MVF at this point for us there, there's definitely a lot of things we listen to customers really carefully the stuff we're building is all based on you know customer problem how do you fix this on the platform you know, that type that type of thing we're, we're relatively rarely at this point like going in and saying here's some engineering objective that we have that we think we should build um, but until the platform is built we we couldn't do that effectively And so, it, you know, from that perspective, like we, I, I really made, in my mind, an almost business ending decision. And when we started Rack N, thinking that we had, so we, could, we could deliver some core critical, you know, path through the software and everything would be good. Um, we didn't get, we didn't get to do that. That almost crushed us. Um, and literally the engineering team had to stop and say, all right, we actually have to solve the core problem that we have completely um, and then and then go in and start finding the MVPs or the MVFs would be the way I'd describe it um, does that does that make more I, mean, I can give some more concrete examples that might flush no, it makes sense. And it, 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 what you're telling me is maybe we should investigate destroying the word MVP. And I understand what the purpose of MVP was. It was to be focus, lean, and not create something that doesn't tie to a market. But you have, to, I think you have to apply this, the, the MVP model appropriately, right? It, it, is it an MVP or MVS, what I call its most viable solution, right? It, is it a solution versus a product um, or a service? And, and we have to sometimes experiment. The MVP represents uh, almost, it's the next level beyond experiment, right, to me. MVP is the result of a successful experiment that leads to that is product, uh, production ready. The production well, ready part is where people be get secure. It has to be reliable, it has to be functioning well. And, and that, that to Cause they start gets, going, well, this is what our mindset means about production. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you're, you're breaking up. So I, I, I think you're, I think you've made your point. And then I, then cause it's yeah, I, digital clutter. Um, th no, I, this is, this to me was a struggle. Like no, all the reading I, I did I, and the, the presentations I went to, everything I saw for MVP didn't stress the production, like it was very much a marketing component for the sale. It wasn't about pro being a product. I mean, this comes back to your comment about engineering, right? You, you don't you you don't get to you know you don't get to sell, um, you know, a partially working thing. Um, and I know MVP people would say, oh, I don't. We never meant that it would be partially working. Um, <laughs> there seems right. to be this fundamental difference between the type of product that you deliver 
and it's other types of products that have the option of, M of an MVP. So for example, uh, we were developing a game at one point and we would put buttons in the game that literally did nothing. So you click the button saying, you know, share with friends, right? I don't know what. And the, the button would literally do nothing, but, if, but except send off a, a log message out to us, send out some metric that someone clicked on the button. And then suddenly we see a thousand people clicked on that button. Okay, let's go implement that. Right. So, I mean, that in a game, there's an MVP. But in data center management solutions, I don't, there's, there's a fundamental difference in, you know, what, we, what you can do in an, as an MVP in some platforms and what you can do in other platforms. Right. And, well, so it's like building data, physical data centers. You can't do an MVP of, of building a physical data center. You need air conditioners. You need power. You need things. Right. And that's what you're building. You're building infrastructure for data centers. So just a little bit the different to the different mindset. That that's the that's the place where to me you need to understand your problem domain. Right. Mm -hmm. The button and to me the button is a minimum viable feature. You're like, oh, we've got a gaming platform, we've got a game, we've got people enjoying the game, right? All those things had to be done. And then you're like, okay, I can drop a button in to see if there's a you know a, a feature that people would use or you know, split testing, stuff like that. Those things were great. Um, you know, but yeah, this, this, this to me was the big, the big aha from that perspective. Is there are definitely some things where if you don't have enough of the platform built, it doesn't, the product doesn't matter. I, I like the iPod analogy too. It's like, yeah, you can build an iPod, but if you don't build the well, iTunes store to go with it. Yeah, they're screwed. It was the store that made the product, not the product making the store. Huh, that was a f so what was the feature of the product? The iPod or the, was the feature of the store? Based on um, history, I would say the, fe the product was the store. Yeah. And iPod was the feature. Sure. I, what I don't know, and maybe you'll know more Apple history than I do, is, is if they saw it that, that direction or that was discovered. When the original iPhone was released and when the iPhone one was released, um, the store wasn't, didn't exist yet. And jobs gets on stage and shows the new iPhone and then talks about how the store where you'll be able to buy apps will be available in the future. Just an interesting considering that you're absolutely right. That, that the store is where the is, was, was the actual feature and yet it didn't even exist on day one. Hmm. That, 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 that's making me think. It, it really is. This is, I needed this. This is making me, but this is making me reassess what MVP is good for. Like anything else, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's, we, we've, we've had conversations, you know, when we talked about lean or we talked about, you know, talked about, uh, I forgot the last one, the one we talked about, Sherry did. Um, yeah, that was, that was Agile through DevOps. Agile, yeah. thank you. And we talked about, you know, different tool sets and processes. And the reality is, it goes to me, I think it goes back to what problem are you trying to solve for? What, whether it's a market-based problem or internal problem or whatever that is, at the core of this is what are you solving for? And then what methodology are you going to use to solve for that problem? And then when I put my cost hat in, I go, how do I do that in a cost effective way where we don't allow, that we don't let process or our guardrails prevent us from reacting to what we anticipate as a market change, right? Yeah. But you, you have to, I mean, I, the flip side of it, you have to be careful that you don't have too much analysis and you don't yeah. oversolve solve the problem. Yes. Um, and I, you know, if, I think five years ago, if I'd looked at this and, and realized what, you know, how big, how much product we had to build out before we were at the point where we were, you know, on the MVP, ready to start doing MVPs, um, you know, we might not have chased it. Uh, or we would have chased it, you know, we probably would have chased it differently, but, and, and I, I, I actually think that this is an illness in the startup culture that I see in the Silicon Valley is that they have tendency because the way they earn money is to get out there with an MVP and 
start selling a product, selling it as a product. Figure it out later. There's a, and there's a big rush. Yeah, there's a big rush yeah. to be like, and, and I don't know what else to do because you have to get market feedback that what you've built is useful and all these and all these things. But you know, I can tell you from our experiences, it takes you know, it takes three years to build a, pro a good product. You need early users, but it takes it takes time. Yeah, Mike, thank you. It is a hard problem. <laughs> it's, data center automation is not a trivial problem. Um, no. Because it's, it's heterogeneous. Not. And the funny thing is that we, I just had, we just had a shared colleague that was testing a theory and he burnt himself out because he was going down a rabbit hole and doing so in isolation and didn't understand that the problem he was, he was solving for was not a problem that customers care about. And that becomes huge. That's, that's what MVPs are designed to fix. Yeah. And that's why I believe I, that's why I wanted to have this, this dialogue because I, I'm beginning to believe it's not a one size fit all. And I think there is a lot of, People have done a lot of work and a lot of study around product management, about MVPs, about all this stuff, and they've built a whole apparatus around it and methodologies and approaches. It's like, it's the reason why I have a problem with story points. People look at me like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's that is a good topic in itself. Oh my god, <laughs> exactly right. I'm like, why do we overcomplicate it? Okay, whatever, but okay. So, I mean, it's like we built. It's almost we build a process and we build these apparatuses around the process that makes it so robust that it becomes, we think it's the rubber stamp, right? It, it's just, it, well, you, at some point you're just feeding the process. Yes. It's the problem. I yeah. Understand. Yeah. And I think we kind of got that way with MVP, right? I think we, we think, oh, where's your MVP? Where's your MVP? What are we solving for? What are we doing? And has are we over utilizing MVP or are we applying it incorrectly and we're not going back to the simplest form, which is how, how do you define, you know, most viable, how do you define viable? What does viable mean? Technically it's a, it's supposed to mean that somebody pays you money for it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, I, I agree with it. This is, yeah. <laughs> This is the stuff that keeps me up at night, by the way. Just so I, that's why I wanted to share the battles. Um, I do appreciate, appreciate that. All right, I am going to reach out to the Oxide team and see if they want to talk about what they're building here. Put them on, okay. the, put them on the spot. Everybody, thank you. I'll see you next week. I hope this was fun and helpful. This is great. Thank you so Cathartic much. for me. So. <laughs> yeah, I love this. Awesome. Awesome. Good. Thanks, man. See you in a bit. See you. Hey everybody, welcome back. Good to see you. Thank you, Rob. Okay. It's getting to be like a real lunch, seeing the same people, friendly faces. It's good. I like it. And Keith, this is the topic you asked for, so I'm glad you're glad you're here. Oh yeah, I, I got, I got, I, I'm, I'm sitting here ready and rearing. I, I just need some popcorn and some M and M's, and I'll be all set. Baby. <laughs> oh my god, I, uh, I love it. The, we had um, uh, stories worth telling. So I, I do um, these like little um, rant podcasts sometimes with um, TFIR. But I did one about um, redfish, so I was ranting about redfish, and uh, the redfish <laughs> team called me up, and they're like, "You were saying a lot of things about redfish." And I'm like, "Yeah, I'll stand behind them." I'm like, "Yeah, we agree with you, <laughs> which is good for them." <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't very mean, actually. At the end of it, the guy was like, oh, "I think you're actually, you know, it's not you're you're not you're not being mean enough for it to be an unpopular opinion." But um, we got him. We got him on the phone with my team. And uh, I literally popped popcorn and brought it in the background while while they while I was listening. Oh to wow! The redfish guys. 
they did great. It was the whole meeting was really. I wish we'd recorded it because um, it was it was actually really positive and really That's uh, sweet. interesting. But there, I mean, from you know, there aren't that many teams that do this the type of cross data center work that we're doing. So if you want to know, you know, how how a protocol is working uh, for for data center ops stuff, my team is unusual. Have they come back to you as a pre-evaluator of stuff that they plan to go to market with? Uh, no, I mean, we're, it's all open. Here's, this is our dilemma, but they, they want us to, okay. um, and we could participate more, um, with the DMTF. The, the thing that our team kept coming back to is our job is to deal with what's in the field. And so from a spec perspective, while we have input and feedback, we're not implementing it. We're really not that, like there's things we want to see, but fixing something in the spec doesn't help us in our daily job. Got it. Stay focused on what you need to do. Stay well, it's more, what, revenue. yeah, it's, it, we're not, it doesn't help us to say, oh, that's fixed in the next version. We have to deal, we deal with the material that shipped. Um, so it's nice. I mean, we, I think everybody on the team would love to have the time to say, Oh, we'd really like to have an API that does this, but you know, it's going to take them from that discussion to us getting a server with that Im feature implemented. It's going to take a year. And it stops you from looking at other opportunity, other offerings that may have solved that problem today. No, it, well, it, for us, we, we were already heterogeneous. So yeah, that our, our stuff, it's like, I don't care if you don't like IPMI or not. It's a fact in the data center. I don't care if you don't like, you know, um, uh, you know, like Dell, Dell or HP, ILO, and you'd rather do everything Redfish, or you, you don't like UEFI and you want to stick to Legacy BIOS, or you only like UEFI and you want to, you know, you want to, you want to uh, shut down all the Legacy stuff with Fire. It's there. You have to. You have to deal with it. Um, and then you get weird stuff like a server has to go back into legacy BIOS to fix a problem or because some vendor doesn't support UEFI yet correctly. It's, I mean, the, the war stories that we get, um, it's unreal. Um, so yeah, to, that goes back to my, my, my old upsetness of, of the product centric culture that we're, we've gotten ourselves into, right? What do you mean? I think there was, I came up old school, so I'm, I'm old. Um, you know, I, you know, we, we, I was dealing with, you know, config problems back in the day when I put servers together, right? You know, we didn't have plug and play when I started in this business. IO configuration issues were a nightmare, right? It was hunt and pike guess. And you learn how to troubleshoot stuff. You learn how to solve for problems that were not in the manual, right? It's like one of the biggest things. I, I when I when I first went to Singapore, I, I headed up a team, and and I and I remember bawling out a vendor, and I said, you know, you need to go beyond the the, the box, go beyond the manual, and look for this. And so I, I guess for me, it's. I think we're losing some of that in this product centric world. And it's really the, the enterprise shops that's, you know, the, the, the executive that come down and says, I want that go buy a product to solve the problem. And I think we've taken engineering out of engineering. <laughs> I mean, I just think we've taken the, the practice of engineering, solving problems, you know, doing a, a you know, a, a kind of scientific approach to solving the problem. So you know how to fix it. We've taken that out and say, Oh, just buy a product, buy a product. I had a customer once yeah. that had a product. It sat on the shelf for a whole entire year to the point where it was coming up for renewal and they still hadn't installed it. We've been there. <laughs> we, we, we got the cloud bees um, uh, proof of uh, POC running and we decided to not renew it because we never got to it. Enterprise, that's the way it is. This is, well, this is, I, I struggle with this because, right, we're all moving to SaaS and we're moving to cloud, right? That's the, that's the market direction. You'll, you'll hear in the presentation, it's not where RackN thinks that we're going to be successful. But 
like it's super easy if I have a SaaS, nobody has to install it, which is nice, right? But I'm running it. Your data is now my problem, um, right? It's it, we, We've got all of this stuff where we've turned it into a service and that's super handy, but we never actually addressed what it would take to actually make it easier to run the software, like why the, the stuff ended up on the shelf and was so hard to implement. Hmm. Um, so that, that's where I, you know, I agree with you. It, it's the problems that we're talking about um, from a data center perspective are, are, you know, it is engineering. It is running your own stuff. But I'm, I worry that if we sassify every single thing, you you don't ever engineer it. You're just gluing you're you're gluing SASs together, but you're not you're not actually learning how to run run oh, the system. Yeah. That's what AWS does, right? It makes you it makes you uh, like so I say you say, it says it make you cloud dumb. Um, I mean it does, right? It handles it obscures everything that it does to make it work. Um, and you know developers love it because they get their cookies faster, right? And 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 I sit up and I laugh because I'm like, yeah, I, I've begun to think, and I and I've run development shops, I've run back end shops, I've I've begun to think that I don't know why the business believes the developers like a hundred percent. And what I mean by that is for years developers said, well, the systems guys take forever to build a server. Okay, and then we went to you know blades or VMs and they said, Oh, it takes us two fifteen days to get a VM. We need to move faster. That's what's slowing us down. Yeah. And no one had a conversation when the system guys were saying the applications are bloated. I remember when I worked for Telco, um, this is when I worked with Larry. We're at Horizon. And we built a um, project that was called TCCP. It was an internal cloud. So we took, I mean, the work we were doing, this was several years back, and we were doing zero touch cloud deployments. Um, just top of rack constructs. We were able to build a four rack, 28 sled per rack data center in eight and a half hours from the minute we pushed the first pipeline. Yeah. So automatically. When we installed, when we had the apps come on board, we started having failures. We didn't, because we didn't put requirements in. We let them go because we, we knew we had a bunch of horsepower. We had compute power out the wazoo. We didn't have any issues. We said, okay, you know, because we kept asking, what are your requirements, what are your requirements? And he couldn't tell us. I'll cut the story short. So we had the, it was Thanksgiving and I had to shut it all down. I said, this is ridiculous. We had failures out the wires, we shut it down. So we started letting applications load one at a time. We got the application teams in the office. Okay, you're gonna load your stuff, we're gonna load. We started, we put severe monitoring on it, saw everything. Turns out this was supposed to be microservice. So this is bare metal containers. They <laughs> <laughs> They had stuff that was averaging. I believe, if I remember correctly, they had some that were 34, some that were 50, some that were 50 gig of a in service memory. loading. In memory, like a in memory footprint. And they didn't, because yeah. it was all it was all using um, Sprint framework, and they took the whole framework when they developed the service. So you had 80 services per product, but they didn't, they didn't scale back what they got from the, from the framework. They just accepted the entire framework from the sprint architecture. Um, uh, uh, and here, here's the interesting thing. So they had failures. So we basically had a continuous failure stacking. So we got to the point where we could kick everybody out. We said, hey, you're failing, get out and move it. And that's how we figured out we would have never known because they had, we were saying, this ain't microservices. This is freaking, I don't know what you wanted to call it, but it was the size of a, a, a walrus. Yeah. And so I, my point is, is did that it, we've got, did they, did they ultimately refactor? I mean, it's no, they, they, they well, we had something that big. They, we, that well, we had, relevant. yeah, we had Dell bring in an expert. They went and they said, yeah, they had, they got them down to 15 gig. Um, they, they tried to do some refactoring. They, they knew that they had to go rewrite. But if we didn't do that, everyone was looking at us as the blame. They were looking at the infrastructure mm -hmm. as the blame. And so you get into this blame thing instead of working together 
and understanding you can't deliver bloated services. You know, the whole purpose of a microservice is a microservice and they, they were still developing for a VM, right? And uh, I just think that, I think until executives get the understanding that everyone needs to be at the table, and I know that's what DevOps is supposed to mean, um, but everyone's supposed to be at the table, the only way you're gonna get accelerated speed is to slow it down. And you're gonna have to be methodical and you're gonna have to bring engineering back 